Ellis, Michelle, Francisco, welcome to the High Impact Athletes Podcast. Hi, thanks for having us. What's going on, everybody? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, we've got, we've got a, a group here. We've got a, a whole family with us on the show today. Uh, I'm going to do my best as a very amateur host to... Um, to try and pull as much information and, and gold as I can out of everyone here. Um, but before we begin, I just wanted to set some expectations of the, the level of questions that you guys should expect from me in, in the racing world, because my knowledge of racing basically comes from a few seasons of Drive to Survive and, and various other movies. Um, so that's just where my level is. So please, please bear with me. So... Just to set the stage, uh, Ellis, do you mind telling us what type of cars you're racing, what type of events you're racing in? Yeah, so uh, I've been in electric motorsports since 2020, so uh, what a year to kick off your career, for sure. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we did a little bit of electric karting for two years in Germany, Spain, and then European Championship, World Championship. So um, after that, it was a no-brainer to make the switch to electric race cars, so did a lot of demo driving in the era championship car last year and now we got a full calendar of two electric championships this year with next gen cup and era so uh yeah formula cars touring cars getting to drive it all uh so it's definitely been quite an experience to drive pretty much every electric racing card on the planet and now i'm in pretty much the only two available junior electric categories in the world wow and and is doing two side by side is that double the workload is that unusual to to be doing two different uh, championships next to each other from about 50 percent of drivers it probably is usually you stick to one for the year but uh any of the ones that are with top level teams or are you know in driver academies they always end up usually doing two or three championships a year so the more seat time the better uh just driver development getting that that practice laps in so for me, it's really, you know, uh, I can handle it. I'm not uh, going out there tired or anything. So uh, we keep throwing races at me, throwing new cars at me to see what we can do to maybe give me a little challenge along the way. Speaking about being tired, uh, before we started recording here, you guys were telling me about the uh, the turnaround that you had at, at your home base. Uh, Michelle and Francisco, do you mind just telling us a little bit about what the situation is right now? Yeah, we, uh, we refer to it in the Spezia household as the great schlep. Um, we've actually <laughs> joked that even though The Age of Light is like the amazing racing documentary that needs to go to Netflix, like the real story is the great schlep. Um, you know, we have a behind the scenes vlog that I do that literally is us packing and unpacking the car and packing and unpacking the bags. Um, we're in a brand new apartment that we moved into a few weeks ago. It's still fairly empty because we're never really here. Uh, but the biggest benefit is that we are now on the first floor of the apartment, whereas for the last two years, we've lived in apartments on the sixth floor floor of walk-up buildings so it was good for like practical fitness um but everyone is happy that when they get out of the car at midnight after driving for seven hours like to turn it around 24 hours later that now there's only one flight of stairs to go up so i think we're all we can all agree that that's like the best part about the new apartment for sure (laughs) nice and uh and i recall that you guys have something like a 36 hour window to to get back get rested and then get out again yeah, it's almost like a, a like, pit stop. Like a pit stop, essentially. Like, <laughs> how, how much laundry, how much food can you cook to kind of balance your diet? Get my gear ready for because I do the filming, so I have to get batteries charged and everything. Get Ellis into the gym to do some strength training, all within a 36-hour window before we we get in the car again. Yeah, that's incredible. And so, from my drive to survive. Uh, racing experience I've seen a little bit uh, of sort of the warm-ups and stuff that racers will do to get prepared for being in a car with all the g-forces do you mind just going a little bit deeper into the type of lifting the type of training that you guys do to to get prepared for that type of activity yeah so it's really you know it's a lot of it's a lot of the normal stuff that you know anyone would do if they're just in general fitness but all of it pretty much is all weighted so if I'm in the gym, you know, if I'm going to do 10 push-ups, it's going to be with 20 kilos on my back instead of just doing normal ones. And everything is a lot slower, so you're under tension for a long time. You know, it's better for me to do 
two or three reps with, you know, a five second negative than to do, you know, 10 reps going as fast as I can. So it's a lot of that. And then all the specialty neck training, we have an awesome uh, tool called the iron neck that, you know, you attach to the wall and it pulls on your head to, to simulate the G-force in the car. So it's just a lot of tension training because that's what we're under. It's, you know, not as explosive as, say, a basketball player or a football player. So it's a little different in that way. And uh, anytime we do a body weight exercise, like a pull up, a push up, a sit up, it's almost all the time weighted just to give us a little extra, extra push. So. Interesting. That makes sense. And we're, and we're pretty lucky. Ellis was uh, essentially born in a CrossFit gym back home <laughs> in New Jersey. So I, I jumped into CrossFit in my midlife crisis phase. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, he got a lot of time watching me get my butt kicked as a nine, 10 year old. And then they offered kids classes and, and so he structurally has always had great gym form and understood the workings of that. And I think it's carried over in a really cool way as a junior driver. He's probably performing exercises at a pro level. And, and nice. it's, it's pretty remarkable to watch. Yeah. Amazing. And just, just mainly for my benefit, do you mind clarifying the difference between junior or what is the progression from there through to, through to what is the, the highest... Uh, the highest level in, in esports. Yeah, so it's it really goes from, you know, when you're a kid, whether you're seven, eight years old in a go kart, uh, that sort of karting has its own ranks and, you know, junior in karting is a certain race class. So it's, you know, junior right. Rotax, Junior X thirty, uh, and that's when you're about twelve years old. But then once you step into cars, it's pretty much any championship that is sort of the first step. So the Mini Cooper, the ERA car, Formula Four uh, things like that where it's a driver's first taste of race cars uh, making the jump from karting is that's usually considered a junior championship. And then when you look at, you know, Formula 3, Formula 2, they're still technically junior level because they're not at the top yet. But the grid and the strength of field starts to become a lot tighter and a lot a uh, bit more competitive. So for for me, junior championship is pretty much anything below the, you know, Formula 2, Formula 3 level. Okay. Yeah, so. but in electric motorsport, like it, this is all brand new, and like so, you've had Formula E that's been around now. This is the ninth season. You had ETCR, which lasted two seasons and now is not even running this year. So it's like everything is still a startup. And the junior categories, you know, they developed this top world championship series with Formula E that's equivalent to Formula One, but then there was nothing at the junior level that was electric. So, you know, for the past three years, that's Ellis has been kind of pushing the boundary every single year of being in all these series that are brand new, you know, for better or for worse, to kind of push the limit of what's available, uh, you know, and, and watch that ladder evolve so that eventually, I mean, a driver of his age won't be able to because he's still racing combustion and electric. But, you know, these kids right now that are seven or eight or nine, you know, they could have a fully electrified career all the way from the first time they ever get in a go-kart all the way up to, you know, going into professional motorsport, which is kind of cool. And he will and, be the first native electric driver, <laughs> essentially, which is crazy to think about. But, you know, in a sport that's a legacy, to have something new is, is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, that's that's really cool. And, and Formula E, that's, that's sort of the holy grail. That's, that's where you want to be. Absolutely. You know, it's where all the, the big manufacturers are. It's where all, you know, the the biggest race weekends. It's a world championship now. So it's sort of the top level at the moment. But that could change in the future. You never know with electric. It could be a championship in the next two or three years that takes that spot. So we'll have to yeah. see what happens. But for now, at least it's Formula E is the place to be. Nice. And I've, I've heard you mention in, in other interviews that you have to race a combination of electric and combustion to sort of build up to that. Do you mind just explaining that a little bit? Yeah. So obviously, you know, if anyone's ever owned an electric car, you know, range is the uh, <laughs> biggest issue. We had an electric van that was way too old for what we were trying to do, way too, you know, <laughs> slow, didn't have enough range. And we had plenty of you know, six hour drives that took 12. So when it comes to arguments, yeah, if you yeah. think drive to we survive, won't shout had, out the, the yeah. car brand no. drive think... to survive had drama. <laughs> Michelle and I at a charging station with German language, trying to pay to charge <laughs> and download the app 
takes out any drama you've seen in, in Netflix. So when it comes down. to being on track and practicing, you know, with uh, electric car, it takes, you know, maybe 45 minutes to charge and you can do, say, 15 minutes. Uh, but when it comes to we went testing with the Ford Fiesta Cup car a few weeks ago, um, you know, and it was pretty much 45 minutes straight on track, which is probably about, you know, 20, 30 laps and then five minute break to go over data and then right back at it again. So when it comes to the practice side, you still need the amount of reps that you can get in with a combustion car and the accessibility of being able to run a combustion car is still a lot easier because a lot of these tracks are still working on their infrastructure. Yeah, right. I think for us too, it, it allowed, there was, it was kind of a funny thing that happened. Like Ellis came in and was doing almost exclusively electric racing in carts. And there was almost this stigma that he was, well, he developed this tagline, the electric renegade, which was super cool. But then there was also this kind of funny stigma where people didn't look at him as a quote, real driver, because he only drove electric. So then we, you know, that's kind of how it started. We had to throw him in a couple of combustion cart races for him to prove that he could kick butt no matter what was, uh, what was in the tank, literally. Um, you know, and then for the combustion racing, it's just the level of competitiveness. The, these series are more developed. They have more cachet. So I think it just helps to continue to develop Ellis as a driver. Yeah, got it. So this is, this is probably a stupid question. I mean, a lot of my questions will be no stupid. stupid questions. Uh, I've heard from people who really like things like Formula One that there's some extra added zhuzh to the noise, which <laughs> isn't there with Formula E. What do you guys think about that? What's, is there something missing? What, what can be used to fill its place? I think, you know, you're never going to make fans of any sport happy. You know, these same <laughs> people that complain that there's no noise also complain that the the Formula One cars sound terrible. So it's still, yeah. it's like a back and forth. But, you know, I think now with with motorsport, we're seeing sound restrictions at tracks. Like we have to run the TCR car I drive with a muffler now. And that takes away, you know, 80% of the noise. And it just sounds, you know, like a normal road car, maybe in sport mode. So we're starting to see that, you know, sound is great. But if you can't get on track because your car is too loud, that's not great either. So... <laughs> When you look at, you know, the old racing in the 80s and 90s when the cars were, you know, wide open, no restrictions, like ear piercingly loud. There were cars at Le Mans. Uh, Mazda had one that pretty much they had to warn the marshals when it was coming because it was blowing out people's eardrums. So no if you want to really enjoy the noise of a race car, it's got to go historic. But yeah, for a driver, you know, you get to hear the tires, the crashes and contact sound way more intense. You know, at Formula E, when they slightly touch, it sounds crazy because you hear everything. So uh, I think for the drivers, it's a little extra element. It's a little different, but to have you know a racetrack where you don't have to have earplugs for your small kids that want to watch and you can really enjoy the whole event uh without you know especially for the small kids that's the key is they they don't have to wear big earphones and you know running around and crying because it's too loud so <laughs> i think for yeah. the diehard fans i get it but you know for the future of the sport and accessibility i think you know it's the it's the way it's going to be that's that's really compelling i mean if I guess if some people want their eardrums blown out, then that's a, that's a personal <laughs> preference. But exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, and these little kids, it's like they're into Star Wars and they love Elon Musk. And so to them, like the fact that these things sound like a bunch of TIE fighters coming down the straight, like that makes their day. So when you watch the seven, eight, nine, ten year olds, you know, going nuts in the stands, this is what is their normal you know it's the it's it's the older fans or the legacy motorsport fans that are seeing the change and like you know we're human nobody likes change so yeah. that's why they're bent that it, there there's no sound and there's no you know exhaust smell so i think it's just something to get used to for them but i think for the younger fans it's it's normal and probably will be a preference and even to ellis's point the experience is changing formula e almost feels it can feel like a music festival, there's, you know, audio playing, there, you can talk to the people next to you while the race is happening. So there's a different environment that um, I think the sensorial part of it is really cool. And it just, it's just a change. Yeah. 
I'm gonna next time next time I'm over in Europe I'm gonna have to get to a race I I haven't well to be fair I haven't experienced Formula One or Formula E so I'm, I'm gonna have to cool. get the boat. Well, it's way it's way less expensive to come to a Formula E race so you... another bonus. There you go. Another bonus. Or you come to see Ellis race and we'll get you in the pit box and then it's like you know total behind the scenes total experience. The scenes. But yeah. Formula E by by next year though right? Next year what do you think Ellis? <laughs> yeah, if someone gives me a shot I'll take it. Why not? <laughs> Actually, that's 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 a question I wanted to ask. So, if there isn't a sort of a direct progression in the electric space, what hap what happens? How do you how do you get recruited? How do you put your hand up for for one of those Formula E cars? I mean, it's sort of you know, it's like any business. You got to put yourself out there. You have to go. You know, Formula E. We went this weekend. I had my press pass, so I got full access, and you know not watching the race i'm walking around the pit boxes you know waiting after the pit walk to see who important is going to walk out that i can you know take two seconds to shake their hand and introduce myself so it's sort of you know like uh it's like being a startup you gotta you gotta put yourself out there and really uh just go you know full send and talk to absolutely everybody and if one person is interested then it makes it all worth it so uh, for the level of Formula E, you're looking at manufacturer support. So Cupra, um, you know, Maserati now, uh, manufacturers like that, where it's not just, you know, a race team that owns the race cars. These are car companies that, you know, have gigantic brands and gigantic influence, influence which is, I think, really cool to be a part of that. Yeah, and you yeah, start nice. to see, like, I mean, it's networking is everything. It's like any other business, and so much of it is who you know. I mean, Ellis still has to go out there and, drive his tail off and be fast and you know have talent and be able to impress on track but so much of it is the network you're building outside you know all the content we're creating um, and then looking at some of these brands of like well what are they doing in the space right like Cupra is super cool and is doing a ton of stuff in electric you know on the consumer side and in motorsport and like metaverse and digital and video games so like you start to see like which of the manufacturer brands you kind of align with and where I mean Ellis is the driver he's he's like the asset right so you know where does he personally align with what these different brands and manufacturers are doing and then how do you kind of sell yourself to them as you know someone that would make a good megaphone because essentially that's what a professional athlete is right like a megaphone for themselves their brand you know what that brand believes in so yeah, yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more, and that's uh, we'll we'll get onto this stuff a little later. But that's <laughs> that's like the the basis of why I'm excited about high impact athletes. Um, yeah. And how many how many seats are there going in Formula E? I think it's 22 now, right? It's a little more than F1. It's 22, so 22 seats, uh, and then it's it sort of changes. Like there are a few manufacturers that dropped out last year, then filled in with new ones. So racing's a sport that constantly changes, but 22, so 10% more available than F1. So. <laughs> nice. Two. <laughs> Great. I mean, when you think about that number, it's pretty crazy in a professional sport to be at the very top. If you're an NBA player, how many NBA players are there that are at the top? And 22, you know, electric drivers, and in, in even F1, there's 20 on the grid. So you, like, to Ellis's credit, he's pushing not only to be the best athlete on the track when he's driving, but also the best brand, the best networker, and really all of those things do come into play because the, the barrier is so big and the, the payoff is, you know, 20. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, I, imagine, I imagine it's a little different on the electric side to, compared to Formula One, where with Formula One, because you've got such a progression from, you know, you, you can prove yourself on the track, and, and be selected based on your driving, but on the electric side, you've you've got to add in all this other stuff. It's actually, it's quite cool to to have to add in the the networking, the the entrepreneurial mindset to to being selected. I mean, in my head, it's it's sort of like adding a whole extra batch of life skills to to this career, which you know, yeah. life post racing, it must be must be hugely helpful. Yeah, I mean, I think no matter what Ellis does, I mean, I think that he will continue as a professional racing driver, but wherever he ends up in life, you know, all of, everything we're doing is relevant, um, 
you know, mm. and amazing skills for him. But I think that, you know, when you look at traditional motorsport and even electric today because it's so new, like a lot of it really is just legacy families who've been in it forever and it's kind of the who you know and who owns the team. Um, and a lot of it is just driven by an incredible amount of wealth. And so, I mean, we from day one, like we're not motorsport people. I was a teacher, Frank is a filmmaker, like this was not our business. I always said like we didn't have a driveway, let alone a garage. So like where the hell I was going to put a go-kart was just not even, being a, a racing driver was not even in like the scheme of possibility when I looked at Ellis. Um, so we're just hacking our way to the top, you know, like we're using everything we've got, which is not the usual skill set of a legacy motorsport family to just say, all right, we're going to do this a different way and we're going to, you know, make a lot of noise and produce a lot of content and, you know, position Ellis in a way that allows him to develop as a driver and an athlete, but also kind of gives us that special sauce to make sure that, you know, people are paying attention and that when there is a seat available, they want him in it. Yeah, this, this is something that I wanted to get into a little bit. Um, because it is, it's so impressive and it's so drastic to go from that life that you had as a teacher and a filmmaker and, and driving go-karts to say, okay, screw it, we're going to do this and pick up everything and go and, and pursue this vision and this dream. And In the middle of COVID, by the way. <laughs> no big deal. Which just made everything easier. Yeah. Um, I'm... The thing that I'm really curious about is sort of the the last straw. Like, what was there a moment where you guys, as a family, like the moment that was like, okay, you know what? Actually, let's do this. Can you guys think of a of a particular point in time like that where it just it finally sort of made enough sense to to go for it? What would you say, Alice? I don't know. Uh I mean, I think once. Once we started winning the indoor karting stuff, it was like we got to move on. And it was either we go and buy a combustion cart and, you know, you have either a friend that's a mechanic or I learned a mechanic myself. And I either club race for the rest of, you know, however long I wanted to. And, you know, whether you couldn't afford to club race anymore or, you know, it sort of lost interest or go into headfirst a race in Europe, which is pretty much, you know, the best of the best. And I think we've always liked to throw me into the fire head first. So <laughs> it was all or nothing. And yeah. I think we made the right choice in the end. You know, I, th I think like every eighties movie, that was great. <laughs> you know, there's like this montage, the montage moment, you know, and Ellis drove indoor karting in a mall and he was a part of a competition and he competed and he started in pretty much the middle to the back and he spent the whole season working his way up and he won in you know a regional championship and I, I think at the shopping mall at the shopping mall but I think when you're an athlete and you win something like learning to win is different than anything else right and once you see that and I I was when he was in the races I was always wondering does he have that little extra to just go for it and in his final race I watched him you know, any great athletes had that moment, that Michael Jordan moment where they're just in a zone and they're doing everything right. And I saw that and I said, this is, this is it. This is what he's meant to do because I'm not a race car driver. You're not a race car driver. This is all in his DNA and it's coming from somewhere else. So. Yeah, but listen, I think it, when you posed the question, it made me think two things. Mm -hmm. Like thing number one is, okay, Frank and I met in the 90s in New York City. So we've been married for 20 years together for almost 25 we have like picked up and ditched our current life for a new life like time and time again right like yep. that right. process is not new to us and i'm gonna like you know excuse my french but we call it the fuck it let's do it attitude right yep. like eh, well like what's the worst thing that can happen <laughs> yeah. like yeah sure let's do that yeah. you know pick up and move to a new state without a job like you know quit your well-paying day job with benefits to start your own company like we've done this time and time again sure. so like to people who know us really well it was not surprising when we we're like oh it's the middle of covid lockdown we're selling the car getting rid of the house and going to europe to go go-karting right when like the rest of the world was like what i'm not going to the grocery store because yeah. it's deadly um so i think that part of it is just in our DNA. So I think, Ellis, I think you're kind of lucky that you've got the parents who are like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. What's the worst thing that could happen? 
Um, you know, and, and so I think there's like that kind of unabashed like bravery to be mm -hmm. like, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. I also think that we're the people who um, have like a, a very, almost like an idiotic optimism about certain things of like, you know that's gonna be super hard, right? Like who leaves the country to go race electric and think that their kid is gonna like make it to the top? And we're like, yeah, sure, okay, that could be us. You know, but so we never choose the easy route, that's for sure. There's also like sometimes power and ignorance. Like you just sort of are ignorant to the struggle that's ahead. And you, you're so optimistic that you jump in and then it's really worth it. And it's too late to turn back, so. And if you have the hard work effort and you really believe in what you're doing, then you'll break through that part of it. But I think like assuming that you can just do this and, you know, I think is part of like our success and failure in many things. And Ellis had to meet us there. He had to want it just as bad. Um, once we once we decided, like you said, when is that critical moment that this is goes from like a hobby to a career, I guess. And we did like baby step it. Like the first year, which was 2020, we were in Europe for three months because you only get 90 days as an American citizen. So mm -hmm. we were here for like 92 or 93 before we hoofed it back to the States. And then year two, we were here for seven or eight months during the yeah. race season. And then by last year, you know, we live here, we live in Europe full time. So it was kind of like edging in a little deeper every year. And also the Germans have to warm up to you. So there's <laughs> like a, there's a duality to that process. It's easier the second time you come back. Then they're like, oh, yeah. we didn't scare these people off. Yeah. All right, we'll be nice to you now. Yeah. I mean, we, we, when we first made our trip, we had to Jason Bourne our way into the country because of COVID. There were no, you couldn't get tested. There were no clear rules. We were traveling in the grayest of areas. And if you know how wonderful the German culture can be, they don't like that gray area. No, no gray so space. there was a big stop sign when we got here. And it was pretty exciting to figure out how to hack our way in. <laughs> it's actually, that's really impressive in 2020 to manage that. Cause I, the latter half of 2020, the tennis tour started up again, and man, it was a minefield. Yes. Oh I mean, man! Even, even if you're on lists in airports, you you still had to you still had to often talk to many people just to get into yes. the country. Yep. Yeah. So, lots of well discussions on essential, and lots of things being stuck up your nose. So <laughs> yeah, it was a it was a journey. <laughs> so many things up the nose. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this. This is another thing that I'd love to understand. So racing is expensive, right? I mean, you know, you see the, the biggest teams in Formula One, they, they can have like a thousand yeah. employees. It's, it's a huge business. And maybe this was part of the, the ignorance, the, the bliss of ignorance and in, in jumping into this. But I'm really curious as to how that side of it works and how you guys made it work for, for you in, in jumping into this racing industry uh, start with a quick saying and then I'll let Ellis jump in the quickest way to become a millionaire in racing is to start out as a billionaire <laughs> of which we are neither and we are neither of those but it's a really it, it really says a lot but go ahead Ellis you can talk a yeah, little bit I think you know I mean with electric we've seen that in some ways it can be more economical but in some ways it can also be a lot more difficult so it's definitely a balancing act of sometimes easier isn't always better or cheaper or you know uh a better move in the long run but um yeah with with electric there's no there's no uh budget difference between the teams so that's the main thing is with formula one you see you know if williams had the budget of red bull or Haas had the budget of ferrari where would they be on that grid so with electric it's still a ridiculously expensive sport and it takes a lot of work whether it's our crypto and blockchain expert frankie over here whether it is our logistics and sponsorship expert michelle uh whether it's me roaming the formula e paddock outside the vip lounge waiting for someone to walk by uh it's still when we show up every weekend we know that all the materials are this, all the materials are the same you know, there's not a, a kid in a junior series where the FIA's goal is for F4 to cost 150,000 euro, and these teams are spending upwards of 800,000 to run two regional championships with the best car, pretty much paying to be able to cheat. We get to show up with equal materials, open data, 
and get you know a lot more support from the championship and get to shape an entirely new side of motorsport which isn't an opportunity you've had since it you know came about so but yeah, I think that's... that's the like even in having this little conversation here like the the number one major elephant in the room is still missing and that's that you know again we don't come from motorsport the thing that shocked me the most that I never would have guessed and that I never understood is that drivers pay to drive until you are at the absolute top. So until you're a Formula One driver or a Formula E driver or a World Endurance Championship driver and you're driving for a manufacturer, you pay for your seat. So the drivers pay. So like Frank always says, if LeBron James had to pay $500 every time he went to the basketball court to shoot hoops, he'd never be in the NBA today. And motorsport is such a weird, economic model where these drivers pay to be in their seats and we're talking like Ellis just said if you want to be in a top European team for F4 which is your very first step into open wheel cars if you're going half a million dollars a year or more just to put your butt in the seat that's not just if you crash the car make the top five yeah so, so the, I mean, again, the oh. access of that is really what I think is, is, is the shame of it, because when you have talented drivers, you know, you think of other sports, whether it's soccer, we could go kick a can or football. Sorry, some, we're in Europe. <laughs> I got to be careful. Um, we could kick a can back and forth. We can go down to the, the field together and start a game. And with racing, your access is, is limited to the track and, and what you can afford to, to do to be on that track and at a junior level. The sponsors are not, you know, dumping money on these these guys to get out there and practice. So, um, from that part of it, I think it's it's a big elephant in the room, as Michelle said. So, I mean, electric is electric motorsport is working to kind of rethink some of those models. It's still expensive. You cannot put economical and motorsport in the same sentence. I don't care what is under the hood. Yeah. Um, it's an expensive sport. And when you see that there are 250 people in the Mercedes pit box and, you know, the, the absolute exquisite machinery that these drivers are driving and the technology, I understand why it's expensive. Um, but I think that there's opportunity for the business model to evolve and change. And I know before this call, we were talking a little bit about Web3 and blockchain and crypto. And like, I just think there are, there will be more intelligent ways to finance something like motorsport and the technological innovation that doesn't fall on the head of a driver or the, that driver's family to give them the access. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's super interesting. I, I didn't know that. And I, I imagine there are not too many sports where the upfront cost is is so steep. Um, there's definitely a parallel in tennis. I mean, it's expensive to be on tour at the lowest levels where you will make a loss, and you will. Yeah. Most people will make a loss for years before they get to a stage yeah. where they can actually start breaking even. Mm -hmm. Which, like like with racing, it's a huge barrier to entry. Which means that. The, the talent is capped to people who can yeah. figure out a way to do that either from family money federation help and so in in the racing world is it a, is it either family money or figure out how to get enough sponsorship backing to cover that are those sort of the two options yeah i think that you know the wealth side of it with families especially in the last decade has grown, you know, but I think what we're seeing, so Ellis is involved in next gen racing, which is the Mini Cooper Electric, and that's a series out of Sweden. Um, and Frederick who runs it was a former driver and he understands the struggle of a junior driver and the access that a family may have. So he really went the route of taking a large investment in the front end to lower the cost of that seat to a number that is really, really digestible and will give all of their drivers this chance to drive in an 18 car grid series across Sweden. Um, so I think when you start to see more of that happening, that's the real change. Yeah. And this, another stupid question. If you crash, <laughs> who pays? You break it, you, you buy you it. You break it, you bought it. You buy it. Oh, yeah. man. And that's the worst Appreciate part. It. Like Ellis last year had two major crashes, both in go-karts. Um, yeah. Oh, damn. <laughs> See that nice scar? Yeah. Uh, also had a knee injury. Um, but yeah, so you crash this go-kart. It's now totaled. 
and now you have to pay for it. Like now you buy this mangled mess of metal that it's like, oh great, I own this, you know, might as well take it to the scrapyard. Um, so yeah, crash damage is a real concern. Like you have to, whatever the cost of the seat is, and then the tires, and then your travel, like yeah, you crash your car and then it's a whole other story. But then you can't ask a driver to hold back and be in fear. <laughs> so, you know, there's a weird paradox there of like going for it. Uh, yeah, that's a tricky one. So <clears throat> there are two questions that I want to ask. <coughs> so, so the first is the first is around fear because driving, even driving on roads sometimes can be scary. And that's at a, a normal, a normal pace. Driving at hundreds of kilometers an hour, inches away from other drivers. So to some, to some degree, I understand the idea of sort of acclimatization, you know, like you build up and you get more comfortable, but there still must be some fear. Do, do you feel fear, uh, when you're in a car or is it complete race mode takes over and objective is all that there is? Yeah, I mean, you always have a few code brown moments, you know, in the, in the rain, you can aquaplane. So you have, you know, a few times where you hit a puddle and then the car is just skating on water. So I think the only the only scary thing for drivers is mechanical faults, because then you have no control. So uh, I had a brake failure twice in the Fiesta. And that's, you know, if I if I if I catch a slide and, you know, I'm going into the gravel I'm in somewhat of control at least, and it's because I made a mistake. But once your car fails you, especially your brakes, then you're just, you know, completely at the mercy of this, like, you know, thousand kilo ton of metal of, you know, just going wherever it's going to go because now you lost, you know, one of the two things you have control over, and that's which way you're turning and whether you're going or stopping. So it's, uh, yeah, I think fear you need a little bit of it because it keeps you safe on track and a little risk management, but. You know, when it comes to the wheel to wheel racing and everything, that's, you know, street circuits where the walls are, you know, centimeters away from the car. There's none of that fear. You know, I'd rather dent my door in than lose a position on a race weekend. So, well, let, and let's be clear his fear and our fear are two separate <laughs> buckets. Because, first of all, Frank I've Frank went for a ride along did, recently. Yes. So, I can, I can safely say a couple of things. Number one, these guys are built different. They, they, and I think, you know, it's, whether it's a musician or a creator, anyone who does something with a skill and they just master it, they're like at a different level, frequency, frequency <laughs> all the way. Ellis, did, you know, his scar that he got from his go-kart crash happened over the summer. We were in France. What was your speed going on this one? I think the scar from Florida was like... 90 Ks. Okay. But, uh, and then France, in France, with, what was France, with, the, with, the France with the big backflip was, I think okay. 130. So Ellis is going 130 Ks. He flips this electric go-kart in the air. He gets thrown out of it. <laughs> I'm on track filming. Michelle is behind the pit lane, watching her son's cart go airborne. He somehow like parkours his way out, <laughs> lands in the barriers. I run to him, because I'm luckily I'm on track, I've got the vest, I look very like official. I run to him with my camera, and I'm first on the scene, and all I see is him sort of like doing Broken this, around. and I go, just relax, I go, he's looking for his go-kart to pull it out <laughs> to go back on track. Damn. He fractured his knee, tore his ACL, the cart's on the other <laughs> side of the fence. I mean, it was like a movie scene. It was like, people are screaming, there's blood everywhere, it's horrible. <laughs> And he's literally looking to drag his cart to get back on because he doesn't want to lose points in the race. It was the last heat of the day, and I knew <laughs> that even if I at least finished the race in the points, I would have still made the top five start yes. for the final, and then I still had yeah. a shot to win the weekend. And I just adore that because I just like <laughs> that's where you know they are just they're running full speed into this, and that's all they want to do, and that's all he can think about. So it, it's pretty insane. Uh. Did you keep the camera on while you were checking? I was at the other end of the track. We do. We have. We have seen the live stream um, that we can share Pretty privately. Spectacular. 
it's, it's pretty, pretty spectacular. spectacular. I would yeah. love to get a clip of that. And it made it I on did TikTok film, as well. I was at your, I filmed some other stuff. It's really hard to hold the camera when it's happening because it's oh, your son, I, right? I so, yeah, yeah it, it, you know, you're in a crazy spot because the filmmaker in me is like, this is what everyone's going to want to see. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I want to see. Early. If I'm going to do a backflip, I at least want it to be on video and have the, you know, live to tell the tale and back it up with some awesome footage. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So it's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, well, so this, this is, there's, there's quite a nice little sort of branching question because I would like to get into some of the stuff sort of off the track. But one thing that I'm really interested in is is the family dynamic and the stuff that we've been speaking about just now, you know, like the fear and, and watching your kid flip and get hurt. And you know, this, this really high intensity environment, uh, on the tennis side of things, I've seen, I've seen people who travel with family go really well and I've seen it go really poorly. And I'm curious how you guys navigate relationships when, you know, you're on this shared journey professionally, but you're also a family and you, and you've got to try and make those two worlds intertwine in a really positive way. And I just, I just wonder what you guys think about that. And if there have been any difficulties or, or, uh, yeah, whether it's I just mean, been smooth get, sailing from 2020 We didn't get divorced over the electric vehicle charging, no. you know, no. mayhem in year one. So we're still here. <laughs> Um, I mean, again, I think our I think our entire past up until that moment in 2020 where we ditched it all and left, like prepared us. So like Frank and I have been in business together almost since day one when we met mm -hmm. in the 90s, which, again, was never the plan. Like we were never like, yeah, let's be power couple business partners. Like it just kind of happened. So we've had multiple business ventures together before Ellis, yep. um, the film company we've had for 17 years, we started when I got pregnant with Ellis. So Ellis was kind of just born right into this crazy entrepreneurial yep. family. Um, and then I was a teacher in Ellis's school. So I was actually Ellis's middle school teacher. So any okay. parent and child that can survive that dynamic, I think, like, I think we're, I think we're good. But I mean, listen, we're still a family. We're together, God, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, it, we have our moments. I think the moments are there. Considering how much time we spend together, it's remarkable, actually. And I, I've come to a conclusion this year, and, I, and I've said this a few times. I always thought I was the main character in my story. You know, like, I'm the main character, right? And then I realized this year. Then you year, met Ellis. I'm like, wait a second. Ellis is the main character. You're an extra at I'm best. just a supporting character. And I think, you know, Michelle and I have lived such a kind of like unique and traveled and well-versed life together. And with Ellis as a unit, it's always just kind of worked. And this is just an extension of that. I'm, I'm thrilled at 17, I get this time with him. I expected him to be like long gone, you know, with friends and, and, and doing his thing. And, and now I get like a, this extra shot of time with um, my son. So I think though, anytime the moments, you know, whether I'm driving too slow or not Someone's parking the car. chewing too loud, yeah. my God. It's just, you know, everyone has that stuff, but on the big picture, I just think we, we constantly come back to feeling super fortunate for this time. Amazing. What's your point of view, Ellis? I mean, you're the 17 year old. I couldn't imagine yeah. when I was 17. Like, a, spending yeah. an hour. I think I lean more to the loner side. You know, I spend a lot of time in my cave slash room working on <laughs> RC cars. God knows what projects on my computer, of what rabbit hole I went down, you know, on that given day. So, yeah, we got doors now. So, that's a plus compared to our old apartment. Our last apartment which we moved into like sight unseen because you're an expat living in a foreign country. So you like rent these furnished apartments. We didn't realize till after we moved in that there were no doors between <laughs> like the master bedroom and Ellis's room. And I mean, we don't need a ton of privacy, but yeah, when you live and breathe yeah. on the road together, like to get home and be able to shut your door is, is really nice. So yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I can imagine that. And, and just last, last question on that. Ellis, because it's your parents who are so heavily involved, I'm, I'm just wondering, with things like crashing cars, do you, do you think, it, is, it, is it harder? Do you feel more pressure because, because your parents are so heavily involved? Or do you think you'd feel more pressure if it was 
sort of purely professional and 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 you were just under under a team like do, yeah have you ever thought about that i mean obviously i'd much rather be spending some car manufacturers money on my <laughs> incidents on track but you know i'm i'm lucky that i'm not a very accident prone driver i think i'm very responsible out there you know if you look at uh the results we have there's a lot of drivers that sure they get on pace quick but they also bin the car every other weekend uh so i think in that way you know going up from indoor karting you know going to racing schools and knowing that we have to keep this car in one piece uh i think on that side i'm i'm pretty pretty all right whether it's uh fiesta formula car um i'm usually pretty responsible out there when it comes to pushing the limits and uh knowing when it's okay to go a bit over the line because it matters so whether that's last lap going for the podium and you gotta you know sacrifice your fender or your door uh for p3 or p2 or p1 it's uh it's all just you know risk management pretty much yeah, I mean, it's a super delicate balance, right? Like, he's a 17-year-old, so he's on that cusp of, like, in another two or three years, the hope is that he's out in the world doing his own thing, and I, you know, I hope he always respects us and relies on our opinion or point of view for things, but it's always this kind of tightrope walk of being involved to make sure that he's protected and feels safe and is, I don't know, like, Motorsport's a shark pit, right? So, like, I'm not going to just dump him into the shark pit. If anything, though, I think he kind of protects us more than we protect him. But then also, like, knowing where those boundaries are, you know, like, we go to Formula E, like, he's got to take his pit pass and go do his own thing. And I have to trust that he's going to go, you know, make connections and talk to people and do what he has to do. So it's a tricky ba- it's a tricky balance for any parent. And then, like you're saying, we're kind of in this family business together. Um, and we don't come from motorsports, so in a weird way, at 17, no child wants to hear their parents' opinion when they are an expert, <laughs> let alone I'm not an expert. So when I <laughs> pretend to talk about racecraft or balancing weight or low-end torque, I get to mess with him and let him roll his eyes because yes. I have no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, and, and it's a great way to embarrass him and make him you know, like, feel like, okay, my dad thinks he knows everything. Um, but... Yeah, <laughs> Overall, like he is the expert, and we're learning as we go, and that's just part of the deal right now. So it's it's actually a lot of fun. Amazing. Last question before we go off track, uh, Francesco. On on the website, you're called the the Vision Man. Uh, <laughs> what what's your vision for electric racing in the long term? Cool. Oh wow. Um, I think, so my vision for electric racing, I think it's, there's a couple of factors involved and I think we're seeing small steps. Number one, drivers with ownership of their social media, Web3, potential sponsors, starting to find their voice at a much earlier age in this environment and becoming their own brands and, and really like understanding what that means. Ellis is a fast driver. He's also a, a hyper fast learner. And I think when you have that skill set, you're able to do a lot. I think with electric racing, my vision is that we're building this bridge as we walk across it, and Ellis is walking across it, and and hopefully we'll be able to bring that knowledge down to the younger generation over the next decade. But the goal is to lower the cost of entry, to get the talent in the seat, to also have parity of materials, so that there isn't a question on a weekend of what family spent more money and you gotta go home and say, I know we came in fifth, we could have been first, but we didn't have the engine, and so that has to come off the table. And I think also the drivers being involved in the technology and the learning process is super important. Mixing all of that, this is the first time in motorsport that we are seeing the electric cars as consumer products and not really the racing model, where it always was like racing influenced the consumer the Ford Mustang, all of these great moments in time excited consumers and it's reversed right now. So the next phase of that is getting electric racing youthful drivers who are excited to be there, don't care about noise, don't care about any of that, just want to drive in a, in a fair field, but also inspiring like the next group of drivers and consumers. And that's how we like electrify and get mobility across the board. Mm-hmm. So battery technology is probably the biggest from a vision side, I think like 
parody, battery. It, it's probably, I could go, we could do our own little <laughs> hour together if you really want to. <laughs> Frank can, wants his own podcast. <laughs> can, I, can I push back on one thing? So I, I, this is not necessarily pushback. I don't know how I think about this, but on one hand, I can see how having a price constraint would lead to more innovative solutions to technology, for example, for, for increasing range. On the other hand, I can see how throwing a ton of money at a problem could lead to new ways of thinking about how to increase range. Which do you think is more likely? I mean, and yeah, I, yeah. I guess looking on the combustion side, it would seem to me that there have been huge improvements in engine because there's been so much money spent on, on trying to make these insane supercars. Uh, yeah. Would the same not apply Alice on the electric side? Look at the look on his face. Yeah, I think Alice can take it. My my only first before he takes over and I'll let him run with it is infrastructure, right? Like the infrastructure around the charging, the infrastructure around the vehicles. That's where we're really lacking more so than maybe the capabilities of the car at the moment. But I'll let Alice run with the with this one. It's his bucket. Yeah, I think you know, obviously, with enough money and time, you know, you can develop what you want however quickly or slowly you want to do it but i think to really capture the interest so that what you developing actually what you're developing actually has you know sort of that passion that we've had with combustion for so long i think using the the sort of more maybe unique and less you know just chuck a bunch of money at it we're going to do it all in secret and we're just going to when it's ready going to come out, I think having the sort of beta test mindset that we have right now with electric motorsport, I think is really cool because now the public is seeing exactly what's going to be in their road car in the next few years. And it's what we're driving. So for me, I think the social side with the spectacle of, you know, yes, we could get this done probably quicker if Ford or someone was just in their test track 24 seven, chucking a bunch of their budget at it, getting it done. But right now what's happening is we're seeing the fans alongside the drivers. The drivers are testing it out, but the fans are watching that happen. And the mix-ups you have in Formula E with you know how close the driving is and the strides they're making with the car, I think that outweighs just you know the efficiency of maybe you know a giant budget and a whole bunch of free time. Well, Hello. and a lot of these projects are leaning towards more open source, which I always think like the more minds working on a problem, the better. Like Ellis is saying, it's traditionally been like all this stuff happens in secret and then someone comes out with their solution, where I think moving forward, there's a lot more opportunity for collaboration and innovation in solving the same problem in different ways. And I think you're seeing that in a lot of the electric um, motorsport series of how what they're focused on or how they're going about creating their series or their vehicles, which is kind of cool. Um, but I also think that some of these series have also talked about the opportunity of kind of a, a competitive category and an innovation category, right? So the innovation category would be exactly what you're talking about, kind of like an absolute free-for-all from a budgetary, and, well, yeah, <laughs> budgetary and innovation standpoint of like, all right, how much money does somebody have to throw at something to go absolutely outside the bounds and really, really push the limits, you know? But then have your more traditional category, which is open source, everybody's equal, you know, focused on the innovation and driver development. So there's always room for both. And I think the car makers have a stake in this as well, because if you really look at the, the electric EV market, what's happening in China now, especially, is you can have these no-name brands popping up. They're actually very cool cars. They do their job, they work. They get you to A and B, and, and they're sort of like normcore, right? So what's going to happen to the desire to be in a BMW or a Maserati or a certain car that the next generation may not care anymore about that brand recognition because, you know, whether it's cost or just the cachet. So I think even for motorsport and the top-tier brands, they really have to refocus their alignment on that because if they're not inspiring the automotive community of young buyers to really care about what their why is and why they've created these vehicles, they could lose a big market share over time. I was going to wait. This was actually going to be a quick fire question, but um, I'm going to ask it now. What What are your guys' favorite electric road cars at the moment? <laughs> I don't know. Renault has their crazy little 
I think I forget what platform it's based on, but it's that crazy little one they have now, and it's like a crazy drift car, road car. It looks like uh, straight out of Cyberpunk, and it's got like the old school styling. It was taken out of Group B with what they did. So, Reynolds crazy. It's like a, it's like a hatchback. It's one of the tiny, tiny ones. So I'd say that. Like I love those where it's they take the retro styling, chuck some you know, big aero disc wheels on it, big aero, lots of power. I'm all for it. You would I, think that Ellis that would want, like, the most beautiful, high-performance hypercar. No. The crappier, the better. Like, the, the <laughs> tinier, the more janky. Like, that's his yeah. style. He loves it. There's a, certain, there's a certain attractiveness to, like, when I go out on circuit is that it might fall apart when I hit a curb for the first time. But we don't know. But it's going to be fast up until it does. <laughs> I'm not sure it, it, attraction is the word that I'd put there, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> I really like Hyundai has a has an electric car that almost models after the DeLorean, and and it's like. Is that the one we saw at the car show? Car show. What's it called, yeah. Alex? The, the Envision, and yeah. they they some higher up canceled it. <laughs> Because why not? You know, the one project that made all the people happy, it was an electric car with a hydrogen generator in the back for extra range. And it had, you know, a racing wing from the factory. Because why yeah. not? Oh, yeah, we're going to cancel it after we get everyone super hyped up with our concept and get yeah. it on track with Top Gear. I mean, it was like a 90s-esque, like DeLorean, futuristic, Blade Runner, really well done kind of car. And, and it's not going to production. So that would be that would be what I would like. Yeah. I think I, yeah, I think I saw a photo of that at some stage, and it did look really cool. There yeah, is there is something about retro style brought into the modern era that that's pretty funky, for sure. Yeah. So, sorry, go go ahead. No, I was gonna say I don't know if I have one, and I feel like my answer is boring. Like I love the pole stars; I think they're really beautiful. <laughs> So practical. Yeah. So I'm just like grocery getter. Like, yeah, I'm the mom, <laughs> of course. Um, no, I just think they're really cool looking cars. Yeah. Um, and then there's this other crazy little thing called a microlino. I mean, this thing is like a pea pod that like you kind of get in. It's the craziest, coolest little car. I think it comes from Switzerland or something, but you know. It like fits in a smart car. Yes. That's how yeah, small yeah. it is. Yeah. Can't, can't fit so many groceries in that one. No, 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 no. probably not. <laughs> no. So, <laughs> grocery car, fun car. Yeah. yeah. There's also, I mean, this is not adding much to the conversation at all, but the the um, the new Hyundai Ioniq Five. It's actually quite cool yeah. looking. It's, it's quite, yeah. quite modern and and yeah, that sort of matte silver edged look. I don't know. I, I think it's quite yeah, sexy. Yeah. Okay. Um, should we should we take things off track and and talk a little bit yeah. about life away from cars? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Cool. So one of the one of the big points of difference I see in you guys compared to what I imagine of the majority of the motorsport space is your care for the environment, uh, the action that you're taking in in that arena. Um, not only are you engaged with with us with high impact athletes, but Ellis, you're an eco athlete. Um, so you know a, a few different prongs. And I'm curious, where, where did it come from? Where, where did this passion for the envir environment come from? Sort of just, you know, by proxy, I guess. We jumped into electric motorsport, obviously. You know, motorsport is totally the first choice when you want to save the planet and go <laughs> sustainable. Uh, but it was sort of, you know, like all of our followers on Instagram and the community we have is got into it for the awesome race cars and time on track, but then found this, you know, separate side that is in desperate need of some change. And we saw an opportunity to use our platform now, especially uh, we've grown, you know, more in the past year and a half than, you know, the past uh, years before it combined. So to be able to use our platform for something, you know, as broad as that and to get to push that message in a really cool way, um, you know, not just spitting facts on our Instagram story for hours and, you know, people swipe right across it, uh, getting to, you know, show them a cool electric race car and then use that as the platform, I think is really, really special. I just thought of a new tagline for us. Come for the speed, stay for the sustainability. Yeah. Nice. There you go. Just thought of that. 
No, I mean, like, we're tech people. I mean, Frank is the tech guy. And I think, again, by proxy, Ellis and I kind of get that. So for us, like, the choice to go into electric motorsport from the beginning had more to do with, well, it just seemed like the future and better technology. So why wouldn't you do that? Like, that was the driver. Haha, <laughs> driver. Um, which then, right, like led us into this whole world of sustainability, which I, you know, I definitely think Ellis is a driver. He wants to drive fast. He obviously sees the benefits in what he's doing. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I think the technology and innovation part is probably the most enjoyable aspect for him and how that plays into the bigger picture of sustainability. Um, you know, but it, it kind of like, happened slowly over time. Uh, you know, I was a, a mostly a STEM education teacher when I was in the classroom with Ellis, so all that stuff was kind of native to my interests and my brain as well. So it just kind of fed all these different interests and passions that we shared as a family, and obviously is the topic at hand. Um, in the world right now. So yeah, if we can utilize motorsport, which is super exciting and um, inspiring and, and gets kids curious and gets people excited, and if we can use that as the kind of entree into you know, all of these things that are so important um, and meaningful, then, then why not? And I think, first of all, Gen X parents with a Gen, C, Gen Z child, like he, he's not up for bullshit. He's not, he doesn't want it, he doesn't want to see it, he doesn't like noise, he doesn't want to be sold things. They truly want to see something happen. They want to see action. And I think as Gen Xers, we kind of grew up working hard and making things happen. So when you bring that together, I was in the blockchain space you know, now for seven years and we've had our own you know, mountain to climb about the ideas of sustainability and what do you consider essential and electricity and mining and there's so many variables with that that I've worked through um, in our own messaging that it just aligned really well with what Ellis was doing with racing, that at the core of it, if we wanna see real change happen, these, these areas have to excel and start to grow and we can't keep them down. Um, blockchain is gonna give us transparency in the space and it goes well beyond you know, flipping NFTs. Um, some of our partners are doing amazing things in the carbon credit space, uh, Carbify, I'll give you a shout out. They're, they're really doing an actable change with transparency in mind so that Ellis's generation, not only will it be gamified and fun, but they'll also be in an environment where they can trust what they're seeing because you can look it up yourself. There is no mystery. So yeah, I think having Ellis as this like Gen Z pilot, it sort of pushed us to say, we wanna be involved in this space, but we wanna make sure that the space we're in, we're actually doing change and we're not just saying saying we're doing it for the sake of it. Yeah, I love that. Um, I feel like maybe I, maybe I have a cynical view on this sort of stuff, but I do feel like in the world there is too much talking about change without any real action. So, you know, putting the hammer down on the action piece is, is the thing that gets me excited. So knowing that that's part of what you guys are really focused on is that that's music to my ears. Hmm. Um, and... Am I right in thinking you guys are donating, is it a percentage of your, your racing budget to, to charity? We're doing right now just a monthly giving. So we give uh, $100 a month, 50 to Clean Air Task Force and 50 to Humane League. Um, and I feel that, you know, Hugo and I have talked like this, that allows us to give more overall by the time the end of the year comes rather than like trying to scrounge up at the end of the year. Um, and then if there is... If there are extra funds at the end of the year, you know, and there's typically a matching campaign, you know, giving that bit extra. But for us, I mean, as we just talked about, drivers don't get paid until they get to the top. So a percentage of salary is like, you know, half of nothing is nothing at the moment. <laughs> um, and if I gave you a portion, they might be you. Yeah, 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 even a teeny portion of the racing budget, it would, you know, be astronomical, It'd probably be amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the goal over time will be as sponsors are coming into the team, that a small percentage of yep. whatever the sponsor, you know, funds coming in gets pushed forward to high impact athletes. But for now, for us, it's like 
that little bit a month goes out the door. I don't have to think about it. It's the same amount we would spend on, you know, coffees on the road or whatever, even though I hate those analogies. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you put a little bit aside and you're making a difference. And then by the end of the year, you're like, oh, you know, I've put over a thousand dollars out there, you know, and yeah. put it to work. And I think part of that, too, is just um, showing that it doesn't matter what steps you can take. You have to take some step. And our audience and our fan base, we're learning as we go because we're new to the space and we're new to the sport and we're new to sustainability over the last few years. So we're transparent on the things that we're learning. As, you know, We're going to make mistakes. We're not always going to pick the right thing. But I think high impact athletes and all of these different organizations that we are now becoming a part of is helping guiding us to make the right decisions and push forward. And that's where the true change can come in. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and it is amazing. Even, even if it doesn't feel like a lot in, in any given month, when you look at it at the end of the year and you look at the actual impact that comes out of that, that small monthly contribution, it's, it's yeah. pretty cool. You know, like yeah. the amount of lives that you can change, the amount of kilograms of CO2 equivalent yeah. you can impact or mitigate. It's, it's pretty amazing stuff. And so the, the two charities that you guys are directing your donations to the clean air task force make, makes a lot of sense to me. It's, you know, one of the best climate change charities in the world. Um, the Humane League is focused on improving the lives of factory farmed animals. I just wondered uh, where the, the passion for that came from. Yeah, I think animals. You know, animals. Just, just say the word animals and we're in. Just say the word animals. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you know, Francesco's joke is if, if we weren't spending all this money on racing that we'd like own a dog sanctuary in Nicaragua or something, that like that's what we would be doing. Um, but honestly, like the choice have for we, Humane have League you lost came them from as the well, fact. Alice? Yeah. <laughs> they froze. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we I go. Mean, We're back. We, oh, we might, we might have to retake that, Alice. Yeah, Alice and I lost you for about five seconds. Ah, uh, shoot. So if I. Why don't I just ask again uh, where yeah. where the passion for the Humane League came from? So, I mean, all you have to do is say animals in this family and like that's enough. So we are like, yeah, Francesco's joke is that if we weren't spending all of our money on racing that we would have like some type of dog sanctuary in Nicaragua. But we're not. <laughs> we're living in Europe. We can't even have a dog or a cat or a hamster, right? So um, <laughs> honestly, the choice for Humane League for us when we joined up with high impact athletes and looked at the available charities. Um, we're an omnivore family at the moment. Um, Ellis as a young teenage athlete, you know, he's done the vegan thing, he's done the vegetarian thing, um, but he's an omnivore. And so, you know, that's a choice that he makes. And so we feel that by supporting Humane League, it's a way to say, look, we're choosing to eat animal products, but that still means that we want to see animals who are well cared for, well fed, you know, treated humanely for the life that they have as they're serving us, you know, on our dinner plate eventually. Yep. So that was the choice there. Yeah, nice. And I just as a, a bit of personal experience. So I, I went vegetarian f five or six years ago, but I did actually find it quite difficult on tour uh, eating well as a vegetarian. And interestingly, in those Western European countries, if you're not in the main cities, I actually found it really hard, you know, like, really in, hard. yeah, in, in the smaller towns in France and Germany and in the Netherlands, finding a complete meal with a lot of vegetarian or vegan protein was really difficult. It's like the, the norm is sort of a vegetarian meal is the meat meal, but you just take away the meat. But that's yeah. yeah. So that's you'll eat a plate of potatoes need. for dinner. Yeah. And yeah. then when you're an athlete, and what you really require for your brain functioning and your your body, it's it's even more challenging. Racetracks yeah. are notoriously not the best food on <laughs> Terrible top of it. food. Terrible <laughs> food. <laughs> Lots of fried food. Yeah. Lots crazy. of chicken nuggets. <laughs> nice. Yeah. My uh, my wife and I. I don't I don't even know. It must be in the hundreds by now, but the amount of times we've smuggled just like a raw block of tofu into a restaurant so we can add, <laughs> add, add some protein to our meals. Yeah. Which is, yeah. I, I don't recommend raw tofu as, as the nicest yeah. food, but. Yeah. Uh, whatever you've got to do. When in a, when in a moment, so, you know, yeah. do the trick. Um, so I think you might have already sort of partially answered this, but it's. Partly for, for it makes me feel quite nice, but 
what drew you guys to high impact athletes? Yeah, I think, you know, for, for me, it's obviously in the current climate of cancel culture, Twitter, especially having a, a sort of like database of, you know, proven, you know, places to put our effort our money and you know our time is really really important and to be able to confidently say when we make that instagram post of whether it's you know clean air task force humane league that what we're doing is actually you know what we're what we're putting out on our socials and when we go and track interviews and whatever it may be is that it's almost you know uh it's like sealing a vault door is there's no questioning there's no second guessing we know that what we put out there of what we're doing is actually where our time, effort, and money is going. So for us, I think that was super important because in the world of racing especially, you grow to be very skeptical of everything and everyone. So to have something like this that is very, very, you know, uh, clean cut, there's no, you know, lack of a better term, there's no bullshit. There's no, uh, there's no second guessing about what's actually going on behind the scenes, I think, in the current, you know, walking on eggshells era of social media and athletes especially having that confidence as well lets us really push out the message that we're trying to get out there without worrying of being wrong or being called out Very yeah cool. i think the one other thing is we met hugo in person at the sport positive mm -hmm. summit last year i forget who kind of facilitated an introduction for us and the one Thing that stood out above everything else that we all that he and I and Ellis shared when we met was positivity and having an optimism about the future and an optimism about sustainability and climate action and impact giving that like the whole fear narrative is just I can't I mean I know and Ellis is like I can't I don't want to hear it you know it's mm. it's paralyzing I think it does such a disservice for the young people who are being handed this world in the state that it's in. So when we connected on that point of like, it's positivity and it's optimism that innovation and change is happening and there's a lot to celebrate and be proud of, I was like, all right, we're good. <laughs> nice. Yeah, shout out to Hugo. And he's, he's extremely passionate about the climate space and has actually just produced this amazing piece of contact, like a, a climate update that maybe we can we can link to in the show notes that has some some pretty incredible information and and also speaks about the optimism that you, that you just mentioned yeah. like you know the the only way that we're gonna or, or the way that we're gonna best take action is if we are optimistic and we take positive action towards a better future rather than just yeah. you know sitting in our caves and saying oh no the the world's going downhill world's burning yeah yeah and it, it just popped into my mind and I'm sure. Francisco, you've, you've probably already thought about this, but the idea of, of verification and the crossover with that and the blockchain, that could also be incredibly useful in, in the charity space. I mean, one thing that I think people really struggle with is being able to trust charities and how do you know that if you make a donation, if you give to a charity, uh, what's actually happening on the back end. Mm. And it just struck me that you know, with things like even if it was carbon credits or if it was, uh, you know, things like mosquito nets distributed, yeah. uh, if there was a way to, to verify that absolutely, then then that might do wonders for the charity space. I, I think there there's going to be a big overhaul there. You know, crypto, it's funny, crypto gets this sort of um, stigma that it's not trustworthy and it's this, you know, scam space. And then deep down the technology is rooted in full transparency and being able to see everything. So I think when it definitely comes to the, the, to the charity space itself, um, people are skeptical where their money's going. They want to feel like there's actual uh, positive momentum with it and it's going to the right places. And, and we know for decades that's not the case. So Ellis's generation, once again, will embrace, I think, all of these things and, and stuff of that nature with blockchain will help that space become uh, visible to the public to say my money went to this and it's going here and here's the story behind it so I, yeah I agree I think it's awesome and again just the technological innovation of what can be done so this Carbify who's the the sustainability group we're working with 
they have essentially, it's like a digital twin, right? So there's a tree that they plant in the ground and that tree has a digital twin. It is like triangulated by GPS location and all of that is put through, you know, stamped on the blockchain to verify that this tree exists, it's been here yep. for this long, it's, it's in this location, this carbon, yep. right? Here's the temperature of the air, here's the health of the soil, like all of these things that can be measured through technology to provide data to then say, okay, this we can prove that this is happening. And anybody can have access to see that information. So yeah, I think in the giving space, there's there I, historically the giving space has been cloaked uh, and opaque, you know, because you know, you give to a charity that's raising $10 million a year, and eight and a half million of it's going back out the door to pay people's salaries, you know? So mm. I think it will remove the middlemen from a lot of these organizations and get rid of the kind of logistical bad actors, bad actors right? Yeah, right and make just a more direct line between the funds coming in and then being enacted in communities and for services mm -hmm. and being able to use technology to track and present that information to you know any giver. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I, I guess the, the biggest obstacle I see to this is just that the, the brand that crypto has right now, you know, is that, that idea that crypto yeah. is a scam or could very, very well be a scam and, and yeah. trying to, trying to get away from that. And, you know, I think we have to acknowledge that there have been a fair amount of scams that are based in the crypto world, but yes. the underlying technology, the underlying philosophy around <laughs> it is something completely different. Uh, but I think yeah. changing that opinion in, in the public eye could be quite difficult. Yeah, I think there's a there's a there's a lot of companies working towards it, and you're, you'll see it in the next you know maybe two to three years as we come out of economic crisis on top of it. I mean, yeah. we know once we introduce money and making money into anything, there's there's going to be a a greed factor that kicks in that that sort of skews the narrative a little bit. But overall, I believe the technology and what it's meant to do, and the people who like any space, if they're passionate about that, and that's why you're involved. It will it will succeed over time. Yeah, Ellis, this is this is a pretty heavy question for a for a seventeen year old. But how how do you want to be remembered? Ah, uh, I'd say you know as most drivers, it's all about all records, and I want to be you know, with however many time world champion. But I think for for motorsport especially is just to be like the guy. Whatever you had, whatever you wanted to do, whether it was driving a three-wheeled car on a rally circuit and you wanted to get the most out of it, I'd be the guy to call. So I'd say that's probably it, is to just be sort of like the guy for everything, that no matter what it was to jump in and drive, I'd always figure it out. And, you know, I think that's what we've been doing with whatever we throw me into is – we go to a race week, and even Formula E, we're looking. It's like, you think you could drive that? It's like, yeah, I'd figure it out. I'd be okay. So I think that sort of vibe is is probably what comes to mind first. Nice. Is that is that normal? Are people are people very specialized in the driving world? Do you think that a majority of drivers could jump into something quite different and pick it up really quickly? I think the best of the best can, for sure. You know, if you look at uh, all the best, you know, most of the best F1 drivers, especially from Finland and, and that side of the world, we're all rally drivers at some point. So I think as a driver, you jump in anything and sort of figure it out. And uh, there's definitely a lot of room that some of the techniques might not carry over, but the mindset definitely does. So he just indirectly said he wants to be known as one of the best. Yeah. If we if we if we just peel back that onion <laughs> and said all the best drivers can just, jump into anything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the the best driver full stop. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay, I like it. Um okay. We've been chatting for for over an hour and a quarter now and yeah. I've, I've loved it. We've covered an amazing breadth of topics. <laughs> um last section is a bit of quick fire. Um cool. I think it, it might make sense to keep this to Alice, otherwise it might yes. turn into slow fire <laughs> if we yeah. go for, three for one. Um, yeah. Alice, you ready for ready for some quick ones? And oh, also yeah. the the questions the questions are fast, but you don't have to answer fast. Uh, Got it. Yeah, the, fl the floor is yours. Okay, uh, what is humankind's biggest flaw? Oh, I think 
I think it's it's both a, a perk and a flaw. I think we can sometimes be extremely curious to a fault of going that little bit too far, just like being on a racetrack and you think, oh, I could break a little bit later, a little bit later, and eventually it ends in tears. So I think being in, pretty much infinitely curious is probably our biggest perk and why we've you know gotten to where we are today, but it's also probably our biggest flaw because we tend to go to the extreme. Okay, you've just answered one of the other quick fire questions, which is what's the best thing about humanity? So well done, that's, that's two for one. <laughs> um, do you ever feel overwhelmed or helpless about the state of the world? I don't think so. I think it's, uh, you know, if regardless of the situation we're in, if it's, you know, if it's terminal and they said tomorrow there's nothing we can do, you still got to have some fun, you know, while you're at it. So the fact that we could still have a shot at, you know, turning things around, you just got to enjoy it. So I'd say not really. Yeah. And we spoke a little earlier about that sort of optimism that seems to be built in. That's, that's a beautiful thing. I hope that's, um, I hope that's spread across Gen Z. Uh, what is the kindest thing that someone has ever done for you? Oh, man. Uh, I don't know. That's really tough. There's not a lot of kind people in motorsport. You learn that really quick. <laughs> um, I'd say ever. It was, I think, in terms of credit to where it's led me today, I think we had a friend in Florida of your uh, dad, of you, Francesco, who gifted me Forza Motorsport 3. And that was the like beginning of you know this adventure was that's what I played. So in terms of kindness going this far of from gifting someone a video game to sending us on new uh, four season journey through Europe driving race cars, I think that's what comes to mind as sort of the beginning of the seed in my head that got me here. That's amazing. That's such a cool answer. I, I would have struggled to think of something off the top of my head. That's really, really cool. Uh, what are the three biggest things that define you? I think I am just like our fellow humans and definitely racing drivers, very curious. I'm always looking for every little bit. Um, my memory is like just an infinite you know, it's almost like a black hole, like everything just gets pulled in and then it just stays there and stays there. So um, memory for sure uh, and just curiosity as well. And, you know, I like to think that I can bring a really cool atmosphere to wherever team or track we go to. Uh, we always get invited back to each championship, so we're doing something right. But uh, I think the vibe that we can bring to a team as well is something super special, and we never fail to have a great time on track. <laughs> nice. Who would you most like to see become a high-impact athlete? Ooh. I'd say the man we were just with in Formula E, Lucas Degrassi. He is all over Degrassi. the sustainability train. So I think we got to get him on the high impact athlete side of the of the camp. Hell yeah! Uh, who should we speak to next on the podcast? Ooh, I mean, if we're talking like you know, if it was a perfect Anyone. world, I would say Sebastian Vettel. You know, he is one of the most genuine people in the entire sport, and he has lived through it all. And now he is jumping on to, you know, a journey through sustainability as well now that he's retired from F1. So he would be really, really cool uh, to have on because he is just, you know, he's lived through it all, but has kept probably the most humble character on that entire F1 grid. Feel, feel free to flick me his number when, when you have yeah. a chance. <laughs> um, and very, very, very last question. Uh, how do people follow your journey as a, as a family in this, in this racing world? So Instagram is our number one source of content. So Elysium underscore racing. Um, our website, Elysium.co, pretty much houses our entire journey so far. So all the way from indoor karting to, you know, electric formula cars, electric Mini Coopers, Formula E pit access. It is, everything is centralized there. So, um, any way to contact us there as well there's a, a little slide on the bottom if you're you're interested whether you want to come and see a race whether you want to get get your name on the side of the car uh that's where you can find all of our media and everything so instagram is where we're most active but 
Um, yeah, our website has sort of the, the almanac of everything that we've done so far. Amazing. And it is a really sexy website too, I've got to say. It's <laughs> one, one of the coolest websites I've seen. Um, it's fine work. Yep. Well played. Well played. Thank you. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. I know uh, this was a flying visit to your home base. You're probably very tired. Uh, it's pretty late at night where you are. So I just want to say a big thank you. I thank think you. what you're thank doing you. as a family is really inspirational. It's really cool. It's amazing to see sort of how wide you're, you're spreading your interests and how many different avenues you're, you're going down at the same time. Uh, I'm certainly going to be following with interest. Um, and yeah, I, I really enjoyed this chat. So thanks a lot for, for being on the show. Awesome. Thank thanks you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. We'll see you at a track at some point. We'll you gotta, go get, you gotta give the, the authentic experience. You know, it's one <laughs> thing to, you know, go and sit in a grandstand, but we got to get you in the pit lane. You can see yeah. the drama, the arguments, the, the, who's cheating, who's got more power, <laughs> you know, who sped in the pit lane. So we got to yeah. get you the authentic motorsport experience. You know, it's, it's like drive to survive times 10 because <laughs> the atmosphere is just so, so ridiculous. I would actually love that. That would be amazing. Awesome. All right, yeah. guys, I'm going to uh, press stop.